I specialize in using animation to create behavior change. Animation is easy to translate around the world. It is universally acceptable. It gives you a sense of disbelief. You know that what you're seeing is not real, therefore you're more accepting of the messaging. We can create universal characters with animation. We can use animation in ways that you can't use live action. So there are a variety of advantages in using animation. Well, first of all, everybody was a kid at one point, and therefore even adults have watched animation when they were kids. Secondly, animation is acceptable to adults if the messaging is, accept is adult. I think that animation is universally acceptable to all ages, to all economic strata, to all political groups, to all cultures. So I think that animation has a way of crossing over the various barriers that separate human beings in a way that live action can't do. Let's give you, a, a, let's take an example. You have a character, a real person, the person will look a certain ethnicity, will be wearing certain clothes, and therefore will be limiting in terms of the audience acceptance to that audience that uh, accepts those clothes and those ethnicities. But in animated characters, for example, my latest campaign, which is to prevent domestic violence, contains blue characters, animated characters. Well, no real people are blue, and therefore it works all around the world because every ethnicity can realize that those aren't real people, they're no such thing as blue people, therefore they're accepting of the people. I always use humor to make the point to bring the audience to the serious tagline that is at the end of the spot. When we give the tagline, there is no humor and there's nothing going on in the screen. You simply hear a voice that gives out the message. But we always use humor. I don't believe in coercing people in behavior change. Behavior change has to be adopted internally. The person viewing the audience, the, the spot, uh, as the audience must feel that yes, I accept that change, I accept what the video is saying, and I'm going to internalize it, and I'm going to accept the message, and I'm going to follow it. So uh, it, it, we are able to use animation and to use humor in particular to reach people, to make something that is memorable and that is non-coercive and non-authoritarian. Let me give you an example. Almost all the campaigns on domestic violence that I've ever seen are coercive. They usually show a battered woman and they essentially say, don't do this. Well, I'm not sure that creates a lot of behavior change. First of all, it stigmatizes the woman even further in that example. And secondly, it doesn't address the abuser. It addresses the person who's been abused. And we really need to change the behavior of the abuser. So instead of bashing him on the head and saying, thou shalt not do this, I instead create a humor as a means of communicating to him uh, that he shouldn't be doing that. Well, I've, I've used humor in, in all my campaigns from the very start. Uh, and yes, we have used a number of different approaches. We tried out a number of different approaches, but ultimately humor is what creates an acceptance by the person. When I say by the person, I always believe that I have an audience of just one person. The one person who's sitting in front of my, uh, their television when the spot comes on or when it's played uh, on a jumbotron in a soccer stadium or on uh, somebody's laptop, that one person whose behavior has to change. So I always say I have an audience of one because I don't believe that human beings are grouped. I believe that every one of us is so different in our personality, in our characteristics, in the way that we look at, uh, at the world 
that actually there is only an audience of one person when you're communicating. Well, for one thing, we, there, there are large number of ways we know. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did the Buzz and Bite campaign, which is the malaria prevention campaign, into all 16 languages of Madagascar at the request of UNICEF. UNICEF had taken what we had done in Canada, which was the national language of Madagascar called Malagash, and they had tested, field tested them in Malagash. They worked so well that they decided to version it into all other 15 languages of Madagascar. It's the first time that any media has been put into all 16 languages of Madagascar. So that's one way. The end user, the NGO using it, or whomever uh, does the evaluation. The second way is uh, the broadcaster. We get millions of dollars worth of free airtime. Broadcasters, the programmers, the broadcasters are experts in knowing what their audience wants, knowing what their audience, who their audience is, knowing what their audience will accept. That's what they do all the time for all their programs. So they wouldn't be giving us free airtime if they didn't think that the animation, the material that we're providing to them is going to work. The third way is that we get hundreds of letters, testimonials, emails, uh, and various other way, uh, communications back uh, to us when people write in in various languages. Fourthly, they've been studied by academics, they've been refereed articles written in academic journals about it. They've been about a dozen masters and PhD theses and other uh, student papers written about uh, some of my work. There have been various studies done. Now, we have not done formal evaluations on a global basis. That would take a large amount of money. If we were to go around saying, let's do a baseline study on whether men rape their wives. So we do a baseline study, then we show them the spot, and then ask them the same question, okay, now you're going to rape your wife? I mean, I'm not sure that'll work that well. So we have to rely on all these other methods of evaluating. In the final answers, though, what I say to people is that animation is an art. It is not a science. Uh, and we can quantify it, and we can ask questions, and we can do study groups, and we can do control trials, but ultimately, animation is an art form. The biggest companies in the world, like Disney, Pixar, and like DreamWorks, create animation uh, with like hundreds of millions of dollars. They might spend two and three hundred million dollars on a movie, and that movie might be a flop. It's not that they don't know what they're doing, they certainly do know what they're doing, but you can't test something to such an extent that you're going to guarantee that it's going to be a success when you produce it, because animation is an art form, it is not a science. We have never worked on a contract. In fact, we have no funding for the most part. So it's just issues that I'm passionate about, where I think we can make a difference with mass communications, where I think that the subject matter is ripe for change, uh, where I think that behavior can be changed on an individual basis that will make a difference collectively on a global basis. So the various criteria that I use in deciding what to, what to address Unfortunately, there are many, many issues in this world that one could address. I believe that every single issue can be addressed. There really isn't a single issue that can't be addressed by mass communications, that can be bettered by mass communications. And so if you have this kind of plethora of issues, you have to pick and choose those that you can do. I basically do one or two um, series, uh, you know, one one series every two years or so. So it's kind of limiting by the amount of time we have. This is all done on a volunteer basis, so we only have so many resources we can call upon. No, I have a social enterprise. So I'm a producer that does for-profit work, and I take 
some earnings from my for-profit activities and put them towards my non-profit activities. Uh, so I started the social enterprise in 1995, a long time before anybody had heard the term social enterprise, but basically that's what it was. It was a hybrid for-profit and non-profit organization. Yes, uh, 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 for example, I'm right now producing with DreamWorks Classics, the next series of George of the Jungle. But I've also produced Africa's first animated series in cooperation with the South African Broadcasting Corporation and a production company in South Africa. I produced the first Dutch animated preschool series and the first Arabic preschool series, which was 300 episodes, which was subsequently versioned into English and French and now being sold around the world by DreamWorks Classics. It is, but you know, my work has not been that different from uh, my current work. It's not that different from my previous work. All my work stems from a belief in human rights. So goes, since we're at Yale University here, I actually studied human rights I, in my master's thesis was a draft convention against the use of torture. And since then, all my work has uh, been on the human rights approach. I use the same approach in creating animated series. My belief is that you have a right to health. You have a right to be free from domestic violence. You have a right as a child to have all the benefits given to you as any other child. You have the right to education. You have the right as a child to be with your parents. You have a right not to be taken into armed conflict and so on. And these are some of the many issues that I've dealt with in creating these animated series. So yeah. uh, to me, it's no different than what I did previously. Previously, I dealt with refugee affairs in the government of Canada, uh, people who have been persecuted by various governments around the world. And before that, I headed the United Nations Association in Canada. So it's always been in a kind of international affairs, human rights milieu. Well, the, I think that the best known one is probably the Three Amigos, uh, which actually wasn't my idea. It was Brent Quinn, uh, a South African producer director's idea. But uh, having said that, I think that the most difficult one we did was the one we just completed last year, which was on preventing domestic violence. How do you make rape funny? How do you make sexual assault funny? How do you attack the perceived right of men to do whatever they want with women? And how do you attack the justifications that have become so prevalent in the world of religion and culture and history to justify the use of violence against women and children. That's what we attack. And those are very, very difficult issues to deal with without layering on top the fact that we have to do it with humor.